Okay, I think we can start now. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the webinar Destination Australia and New Zealand. My name is Kamal, and I'm the Regional Manager, Higher Education for Southeast Asia and Pacific at Cambridge Assessment International Education. I will be your host for today. Now, this webinar is part of the Destination Asia Pacific Virtual University Week 2021. Uh, for those who don't know, this week is actually designed for our school community to learn more about key study destinations across Asia Pacific. It will culminate with a university fair this Saturday from 3 to 7 p.m. Singapore China time, and that will include universities from Australia and New Zealand. Now, with me today, I have Ms. Amelia Walsh, who is the Trade and Investment Commissioner at the Australian Trade and Investment Commission, or Austrid. And we also have with us Mr. Ben Burrows, who is the Regional Director for Asia at Education New Zealand. Uh, Amelia and Ben are both based in Singapore. Now, before we start, a few housekeeping matters. Uh, please use the Q&A box to ask questions. And I do appreciate if you could identify yourself and your institution. We will be recording this webinar. And without further ado, I would like to invite Amelia to take over the mic. Amelia, over to you, please. Thanks, Kamal. Thanks so much for having me and um, really pleased to be here today. I think when we first talked about doing this session, there was a really different um, border situation in Australia and I was worried I would be able to have no good news to share with you. Um, so I'm really, I'm really glad to be able to have some good news for you today around welcoming you back to Australia, um, but also some plans for, for the rest of our jurisdictions that aren't open immediately. So I want to acknowledge, um, you know, I know COVID-19 has had a major impact on all of you, but also on Australia's offering as an education destination. And, and I'm, I'm really actually feeling quite positive that things are moving in the right direction. But as we've seen, things sort of bounce forward and back with COVID. And so there's really good plans and we are opening up, but I think it's a bit of a bit of a watch this space. And so a number of times I'll, I'll refer to the Study Australia website today. That's where the most up-to-date information is. So if you haven't been there, I would definitely encourage you to go there, studyaustralia.gov or gov.au. So like I said, I'm so excited that you're here today and showing some interest in Australia. International students are, are such an important part of our um, community. Uh, briefly, what I'm going to touch on today is just a little bit around COVID and where we're at in terms of opening up. Um, the choice that's offered to you across our states and territories, study pathways briefly, tuition costs, scholarship option, um, and visas. So um, like I said, the situation is fluid. I'll try and answer any questions that we have, but are, if there are ones that we have to take on notice, um, what we'll do is we'll just work with Kamal and the team to make sure that we can get, get those back to you. So, okay, so of course, like with everything at the moment, let's start with the COVID situation um, for future intakes. So the great news is that Australia, um, Singapore is basically the second country after Australia, after New Zealand, sorry, that Australia is opening up to. Um, and from Sunday, the 21st of November, we're actually going to welcome back fully vaccinated Singaporean travellers for quarantine free travel into Australia, um, states and territories that are ready. And if we just go on to the next slide, um, we'll do a quick whip around the state and territories so that you can see a state of play of really where we're at in terms of um, being able to return to our students back. So for the um, Singaporeans to travel to Australia, you'll need to have a negative PCR, obviously, and you can go into New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT. Um, so New South Wales uh, has a staggered return of international students, 250 students every two weeks, and that's going to start from the 6th of September. 
uh, prioritising student visa holders currently enrolled with a New South Wales education provider and quarantine will not be required for those students. And so that's going to progress, obviously, uh, next year into new um, new students but this is for existing student visa holders with existing uh, within existing programs uh, and more details for the return um, part are on the study new south wales website if you're already enrolled with an education provider in new south wales um, go there best to go there for the most up-to-date information for victoria um, the first stage of the plan will also have limited number of places each week and is going to prioritise those who need to do practical work, so health and medical students, postgraduate research students. Um, for the ACT, uh, as long as you're fully vaccinated, um, you can return for the start of the 2022 academic year. Uh, and that is through the Singapore travel arrangements for Singaporeans. So for non-Singaporean citizens in Singapore, uh, you'd still either have to go under a study pilot, so say with New South Wales, or seek an exemption um, or wait for the next phase of opening up. So the first opening up is to Singaporean citizens. And that's really just to manage numbers at the borders because the borders have been closed for so long. It's just a phased approach to opening up. Uh, Queensland is also going to open up to fully vaccinated students from early 22, starting with medical and allied health students, uh, 250 students into WellCamp, uh, which is in a regional Queensland. Uh, South Australia is also going to um, welcome back students with no quarantine period, but that's once South Australia is 90% vaccinated. Uh, similar for Tasmania from the 15th of December. Uh, and who have I forgotten? The Northern Territory, can't forget the Northern Territory. So they did have a pilot of about 250 students um, who have already been welcomed back um, and they are looking at what their next cohort will look like. So just on the next slide is a little bit of information as well. And, and Kamal, happy to provide these slides to any, any of, of the participants today. But those are really um, your sources for all of that information that I just downloaded, studyaustralia.gov.au and the state bodies. Um, that is updating quite frequently. So I would encourage you to just keep, keep an eye on that. Okay, so now um, you can think about um, returning, let's start looking at your choices. So I think there's something like more than 40 Australian universities uh, spread across our states and territories. So we have six states and two territories. Um, you can see them there on the map. Um, and I think if we go to the next slide, it can give you a bit of a, a view about where we sit in global rankings. Um, and some of the sandstone universities you may know um, others you might not, and we'll talk about um, some of the great offerings in regional Australia a little bit later, um, but these are our major sort of top ranked universities um, and you can see them listed there by their state as well. Okay, so and there's a lot of choice, and I think that's one of the one of the biggest challenges, right? Is is you've got a you've got exceptional choices, not just around the world, but then within Australia as well. Um, there's an awful lot of choice. So, you know, over twenty thousand courses, forty uni over forty universities, and lots of other institutions as well, um, and also 100 plus English language colleges. And we'll talk about pathways in a little bit as well. Um, and that may be of interest to some here or the registered training organisations. So your more practical organisations. The other thing which I know we all want to get you back so quickly into Australia, but just noting that that might not happen um, for everyone straight away is not forgetting that there are um, online pathways um, and the study with Australia programs. So those universities that I just talked about a couple of slides ago, a lot of them are offering free online courses. Uh, you can do it, you know, all around the world. It's a good sort of, you know, teaser for a university, might be a pathway for you. But I encourage you, if you're 
um, perhaps not ready to get on a plane yet, or maybe your jurisdiction that you're interested in is not open just yet, uh, have a look at what's available and whether it's free. Um, and it can give you, you know, a really good boost to your practical experience. Um, maybe it can give you some kind of credit, some kind of, um, you know, something good to put on your CV and your application. And so I encourage you to check that out as well. I know a number of you already have been. Uh, Basically, the next up, we just want to talk about pathways, and and um, I know a number a number of you will um, sort of know this, but basically, I think it might be actually set out a bit better on the next slide that there's there's sort of multiple pathways in um, to your bachelor's degree in Australia. So your Australian or equivalent, what we call Year Eleven and Twelve. Um, so GCSE A levels, your international baccalaureate, that could be your um, first route into an undergraduate degree course in Australia. Um, perhaps you might do a foundation studies pathway or the third option might be a diploma into some credit towards your bachelor degree. So depending on, um, depending on where you're at in your study uh, and where your interest is, those are the different pathways that are available to you. So how much is it going to cost? Of course, that's what mum and dad wants to know, right? Um, so look, we've got some indications here on the slides and, and it'll be based really on your um, university and your pathway as well. Um, and we've also put sort of the living, uh, sort of your living costs as well on the right, you can see there. Um, so, and those also will depend on whether you're going to go in the city into a main capital or whether you're looking at the regions as well. And when we talk about regional Australia, I think that's sort of outside of the main um, capital territory, capital cities, sorry, in our states and territories. And one thing that's available is a scholarship, um, basically to help drive students into our regions because there's such exciting things happening there. Um, but maybe everyone thinks, you know, Sydney or they think Melbourne and, and that might be the, the right choice for you but there's also an awful lot um, going on in the rest of the country. So just on the next slide we're really pleased to um, to say that the Destination Australia Scholarship Program is back now. I mean it didn't go away it was just that people couldn't obviously access it and, and get into the country um, and so do um, look at that if you are interested in going outside of a main city. Um, once again you can see the information more detail on the Study Australia website and it we can also direct you to the um, Education Australia website. All right, so um, visas, everybody's going to require a visa. I know some of you have a visa, which is fantastic. Um, visas are still being granted now um, where the, your requirements are met. And then as the borders open, you can then obviously access the market to use your visa. So even if you're looking at going into somewhere other than New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT, where borders will open on the weekend for Singaporeans, you can still go ahead and, and start that visa process. Um, and also if you've been doing online study with Australia, and you haven't been able to travel because of COVID, um, those that will count towards your post-study work rights for existing and new um, student visa holders. So with all that said, it is changing rapidly and we're really excited that we are opening up, but um, things are moving. So stay connected with us. Um, that's some of the channels that you can stay with. Um, Study Australia is obviously the main channel, studyaustralia.gov.au. But if you would prefer to see us on social media, those are the channels there as well. And of course, if you have specific questions, I'll try and answer them here. But we can also follow up. And as um, we get more information about opening up, we're happy to share that with Kamal and the team and you directly as well. So thank you so much for having us today. And we're really looking forward to to welcoming you all back to Australia when we can. Thanks, Kamal. Kamal, you're on mute. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Amelia. Yeah, I, I think I, perhaps I just want to clarify to you, Amelia, at this point that our participants are also from the region 
and not mm -hmm. from Singapore alone. So there might be different requirements for different students from other parts of Asia Pacific. And with regard to the situation in Australia, I think the key message that I distill from your presentation is that different states are at different stage right now in terms of accepting the students. So for our participants, do check out uh, exactly the requirements for your particular country in the studyaustralia.gov.au website, which Amelia has shared. Thanks for that, Amelia. With that, before we Kamal, take I'll the just say yeah. that, yeah, just to clarify, and, I, and I'm sorry, being based here in Singapore, I guess, sorry, I do focus on Singapore <laughs> first, but it's, the, it's really the first country that's opening up um, oh. for Australia for students uh, so we've got New Zealand um, we're allowing travellers from New Zealand and now we're allowing travellers from Singapore and then we're going to progressively open up to the rest of the region um, basically as we sort of you know manage um, COVID we've ticked over 80% vaccinated but um, not all jurisdictions are there and so if you're in a country other than Singapore, just keep an eye on it because it's going to be a little while longer before we have announcements about um, other areas and before we're fully open. And that's just to manage numbers as we um, open up. We're not going to open up, um, unfortunately, to everyone at the same time. And it's not because we don't want you all to come back. It's just because we want to try and manage that flow of COVID with the flow of people in mm. um, and so that we can all stay safe. Thanks, Amelia. Uh, you know, before we take the Q&A, uh, can I just request for your questions to be placed within the Q&A uh, box instead of the chat function, right? Uh, without further ado, Ben, over to you, please. Great, right, thanks, Kamal. Thanks, Amelia. Um, and thank you everybody for, for joining this session today. As Kamal mentioned, it's, it's so great to see so many attendees from across the region. So, so welcome, kia ora tato and kia ora from New Zealand. Well, kia ora from Singapore um, by way of New Zealand. I am going to quickly share my screen, if you could just give me a second. And I hope this will work for me. Okay. So as, as Kamal mentioned, my name is Ben and I am um, Education New Zealand's Regional Director for Asia based here in Singapore. So to give you a bit of an indication on who we are, we are, as you can see there on the screen, we are the New Zealand government responsible for promoting international education. Um, so obviously working closely with a partner such as Kamal and his team at Cambridge. And we also look to build uh, partnerships, particularly for our new universities around the world with their counterparts through joint programs and, and other joint products, which I'll go into a little bit more in, in more detail shortly. So um, as, as Amelia has also updated you um, on, I think I thought it would obviously be very helpful to give you a little bit of an update on our border settings for international visitors to New Zealand at the moment. I think if you have already been exploring New Zealand as an, as an international study destination, you probably will be aware that we still do have some quite strict um, settings for international visitors. Um, what we do have, however, and what we have announced is a number of student cohort exemptions, international student cohort exemptions. So earlier in the year, we announced um, between 1,200 and 1,500 existing student visa holders to return to New Zealand. Um, in the past month, we just announced another 1,000 student cohort to return um, from early, early next year. Obviously, that needs to fit within our um, managed isolation uh, quarantine, but those settings and those announcements continue to uh, be made. So we are seeing really positive developments. And we were in a forum just last week with our education minister who also made some quite positive signals about those uh, cohort and now further cohort announcements being made. And so I'm sure you will hear some more, more positive news um, to come shortly. What, what I also wanted to touch on today is or really focus on is despite those ongoing border restrictions, what our education industry really has done is shift from what we always presented as a study in New Zealand uh, proposition, so students physically coming to New Zealand, to more of a study with New Zealand, New Zealand as a interim solution while you wait for border, uh, borders to, to reopen. So 
what that essentially means is that we have created and developed a huge number of study experiences for you to get started in your home country. Uh, I'll, I'll touch on that shortly, but what I'll, what I'll do, and to give you a little bit of a sense of that study with New Zealand um, statement is play you this very short video. Are you ready to take a new look at your future? A new look at the world around you? A new look at how learning is evolving? A new look at how culture can unite us? A new look at how tradition can inform the future? A new look at how different views can deepen our understanding. A new look at how innovation can solve problems in fresh ways. A new look at experiencing a world-leading education from anywhere. A new look at studying in a way that suits you. Because when we take a new look, we find new paths forward. So if you're ready for new, take a new look at a New Zealand education. All right, so hopefully that has given you a little bit of a sense of what I was talking about there. You can see the study with New Zealand URL uh, in, on the video there. I think if there has been one silver lining uh, within COVID is it has um, meant our education industry has, to become, has had to become even more innovative with its products and programs that they are um, presenting to you as opportunities, which um, they're all, all hosted are you um, on our study with New Zealand website here. So as I mentioned, we have a huge range of joint university partnerships and programs avail now currently available for students across Southeast Asia, East Asia. I know there are um, people in the audience from, from, from all over. What I would encourage you to do is, as I said, go on our study with New Zealand uh, website. You can see the URL down the bottom there. This slide certainly isn't big enough to host <clears throat> every single joint program that we have listed there, but there is a massive range available for you. We also, similar to what Amelia mentioned, we have a huge range of online learning um, programs. So <clears throat> those, <clears throat> those really range from uh, free online courses. We also launched a pilot with FutureLearn, the, the, the online learning platform. There's a massive range of, of free courses from our New, New Zealand universities on FutureLearn. And what we, what we purposely did or purposely designed these courses was around a few uh, niche themes. So if you do go on to the pilot, you'll see a massive range um, of courses themed around sustainability. So we, we've essentially themed, themed uh, that, that pilot around the sustainability theme, which New Zealand has very quickly built quite a strong global reputation in. We also are soon to launch a number of New Zealand study centres where you can study a, also a range of uh, New Zealand university subjects in your, in your home country. I won't um, go into this in, in massive detail, but hopefully you can just take um, a couple of really key, I, I guess, takeaways um, from, my, from my presentation or key themes. And you'll see them up here on, on, on the screen in front of you. Creativity is, is one that's, well, it's, it's a theme that New Zealand's really built its, its reputation uh, and, it's, and, it's, and it's, um, yeah, well, it's global reputation on we, Probably uh, out of necessity, where we have we where we are uh, geographically um, positioned in the world, relatively isolated from the rest of the world, we have to we've had to really get creative in, in the ways um, of doing things, and that's led us to really leading the world in, in a number of of industries. If I think if you know anything about New Zealand, you'll know that we you know we're the first ones to invent uh, bungee jumping. We we were the first ones to cl climb Mount Everest. We we we're the first one to, to split the atom. <clears throat> we, for a small country, um, we've achieved some, some great success. And that's certainly been now um, played out in our education system as well. <clears throat> and then that ties into the, the green box there is around quality. So while we have just eight universities in New Zealand, we're very proud to say that we're the only country in the world um, to have all of its universities ranked in the top three percent by the by the QS ranking. So you can be assured that any university you are selecting is, is world class. And that obviously ties into um, producing high performing 
graduates, which I'll touch on shortly. And those graduates are essentially graduating with programs that are future focused. So we have been ranked by the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit for the world's um, top English speaking education system for preparing uh, students for the, for the future. And obviously when you come to New Zealand, you'll know you'll be very well looked after um, being the second most uh, peaceful country in the world and set up really well to provide pastoral care for all our international students. So as I said, I won't go um, into these line by line, but these are just some of the reports or rankings which highlight how we are um, so successful in our in, in creativity. Um, <clears throat> these are our eight universities. So we have three uh, in the South Island, if anyone is, is familiar with New Zealand, we have the University of Otago at the very bottom, which I can personally vouch for as my university. We have uh, Lincoln University and the University of Canterbury in the South Island. The Link Lincoln is a land-based university, so very much focused on agriculture and agri-tech, while the others are, are more generalist universities. What I would also suggest if you are starting to explore options in New Zealand, if you do go on to the Study with New Zealand website, there's a tool in there called My Study New Zealand. It essentially allows you to create a profile of yourself. You can put in what subjects, what careers you're interested in, and it'll essentially match make you to a, to a, to a course um, at a university and put you in direct contact with the appropriate or relevant admissions team. It's a pretty cool tool for you to, to have a bit of a play around with. I've talked again about the, the quality, um, our rankings uh, by, by, via QS. Um, universities um, really are our key selling point for, for New Zealand. And as well as the general rankings, we do um, lead in a number of different, different subjects as well. I've talked a little bit about the work ready graduates. We do um, perform incredibly well for the size of our, <clears throat> our country and the number of our institutions. And I think if, if you go on to the Study with New Zealand website, you'll see some pretty incredible testimonials or videos of some um, alumni who have either stayed and worked in New Zealand or who, or who have gone elsewhere around the world. Again, I, I talked about our um, education system being ranked first among English speaking countries for um, preparing its students for the future, um, which we're also, also obviously very proud of. And again, we're a very peaceful, safe and welcoming country. And I, I, can, I can assure you that when you do, when you are able to um, come back to New Zealand shores, you'll be, you'll be very well looked after. I think anyone who comes to New Zealand speak, always speaks highly of the hospitality and the care that, that we show for our, for our visitors. We're always very happy to show off our country to anyone who comes here and, and you'll be well looked after. Finally, just touching on some of the, 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 the rights that you will have as an international student in New Zealand, Similar to what Amelia talked about, <clears throat> you'll have the opportunity if you are studying at a bachelor's degree or above, you'll be able to work 20 hours a week uh, during the semester, or you can work full time 40 hours a week during this, this semester break. Um, I think New Zealand, a key, uh, I think, highlight of, of, of studying in New Zealand is we are such a small and accessible country that we have really incredible links between uh, our institutions, our universities and industry. So there's fantastic opportunities for you to gain quite, um, quite amazing internships. It's not, and they're certainly not internships where you're just turning up making coffee. You are working closely with leading businesses and, and leading executives, which will give you some fantastic experience to put on your CV um, as, as a graduate. And we have the minimum, minimum wage listed there. So <clears throat> I won't... Um, I won't go on too much longer, but as, as I said, we've got some great resources online. We've got our new Study with New Zealand website, which I would strongly recommend you to, to explore um, the options that you have to begin your study journey with New Zealand at the moment. It obviously also um, allows you to use the My Study um, tool um, to look at options for being physically in New Zealand. And we also have um, our, obviously our Instagram um, uh, and Facebook, which <clears throat> provides a huge amount of detail and like I said, gives some great video testimonials from alumni and current students who are, who current international students who do remain in New Zealand. And if you are looking at any student visa, if you have any student visa questions, 
you want to know in terms of timings, costs, um, requirements, application requirements, please do visit our immigration.govt.nz website as well. That's a great tool uh, for you there as well. So I think that's hopefully, hopefully I haven't run too much over time, Kamal, but I hope that does give you a little bit of a snapshot about New Zealand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Uh, wonderful presentation as always. Uh, I just want to move straight to the Q and A. Uh, let me just go back to my slide. Uh, we have quite a number of questions for Australia. Uh, Ben Burrows, our expert from New Zealand is here. Feel free to ask Ben as many questions as you would like to with regard to New Zealand. Ben, I just want to go straight to you this question from Christopher Jason John. Uh, are A and AS levels required for scholarships in New Zealand? Uh, just one question for you, Ben. Oh, uh, no. So, <clears throat> so if you are particularly looking at, at scholarships, um, there, will, there will be various criteria for, for what our universities are looking for. So there's no um, certain levels or there's no set criteria. But what, I, what I'd encourage you to do, if you are particularly looking at scholarships, on that study with New Zealand website I mentioned, we have a, a scholarships tab and we list out all the available scholarships. And within that, you'll be able to see the various criteria. So there's no, I, I guess, blanket rule um, is what I'm, what I'm saying. Uh, ben, there's a question about pilot. You mentioned about future learn pilot. Can you elaborate more on that? The question is from Sanjula. Yeah. The, the pilot, did you say, Kamal? Yes, that's right. Oh, sorry. So what I, what I was meaning about the pilot, so it's a, it's a pilot project that we have launched with Future Learn. So we have developed um, and consolidated a whole range of free online courses on, on Future Learn, on the Future Learn platform, which I think Amelia touched on as well. So yep. what I was saying, it's a, essentially a pilot themed around sustainability. So there's a whole range of, of subjects um, which have been piloted together and presented all, all absolutely free for international students to, to undertake. Thanks, Ben. Amelia, you want to add on to it? No, I think Ben's covered it well. I mean, I think it's the same service provider. We're just um, offering it from the Australian or the New Zealand angle. Um, it's a great platform, actually, if people haven't been on it. I put the link, I think I put the link in the right spot for the Australian one, but we can also share it as well afterwards. Right. Uh, I do believe I have a message from Dora, my counterpart uh, in Beijing. Dora, would you like to answer this question as well? Uh, yes. Kamal, go ahead. Please. Yeah, please. Um, which one you uh with you regard to for? The, the pilot, is it? Uh, in relation. Oh, you you mean for the Japan one or no, sorry. Uh, because I thought I saw a question, uh, an answer to say that you would answer the question live. Uh, oh I, sorry. Uh, no, it was like uh, when the speaker is taking the question, I would just oh, okay, uh, sure. dismiss so, it. So, Thanks, Sorry about thanks, that. Thanks, Dara, no worries. Yeah, my, my bad on this. There are quite a bit of questions on Australia, Amelia, as well as the general requirements for different courses. You have question from uh, Sia, uh, uh, you know, about these uh, requirements for different universities, especially in Melbourne. Amelia, can you please answer that, please? Yeah. yeah, sure. So, um, Asiya, I think the best thing is to do is to go on to studyaustralia.gov.au and what you can do is you can um, put in a course keyword or uh, say, you know, I think someone asked about photography, so you could just drop in photography or you could do use the drop down menu and say you want you want to look at law or agriculture, um, the level of study. Um, and then the location, or you could not, you know, put in those fields as well. And depending on the course uh, will depend on the requirements. But the, the bit I touched on about um, education pathways is if you're asking to go to go into an undergraduate um, and you don't have the equivalent of a um, year 12 school leaver in Australia, there are also foundation studies that that most of the institutions do that actually give you a pathway to get into that undergraduate 
course. So I would say find the find what what do you want to do first? Um, what do you really want to do? And then let's work backwards. Um, so it might be, you know, that you need to do the foundation studies or it might not be that you need to do that depending on what it is. Or it might be that you do that at one institution and then you want, but you eventually want to get into another institution. So I'd say, um, I think it was here that I work out what you want to do first and then work backwards and, and get the pathway. And you should be able to navigate that on the website. But of course, if there's something specific, we can follow up. Fantastic advice, Amelia. Always figure out what you want to do first and look backwards. And always uh, also realize that for Australian universities, uh, our A-levels, Cambridge A-levels are accepted in all of these Australian universities. They are widely recognized. So, you know, your A-levels will prepare you very well for the different courses that you might have interest in Australian universities. Uh, next question, do New Zealand students count as domestic for Australia? In Australia, so, so New Zealand students in Australia. That's right. Yeah. Count as domestic. Yeah. Yes, I think the answer is yes. I might yeah. have to follow up on that. Ben, do you know that? Yeah, ben, yeah. I think the, yeah. I think the yeah, answer no, is I, yes, but basically Aussies, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think if the question's asking if you're studying in New Zealand as an international student, can you then go to Australia? I think is a different one. I mean, if you're a Kiwi, you can go to Australia and you'd pay the same as an Australian um, mm. student and you can go into school or university. But I think if you're, depending on what, if you're, say, a Malaysian student in New Zealand, I think you'd obviously that would be a different uh, transition. So it's probably mm, one that, yeah. sorry, I didn't, yeah. if some, whoever's asking that one probably might need to look into that a little bit Yeah, or give a little bit more context. But yeah. yes, if, you're, if your home country is not, uh, if your citizenship is not New Zealand, then you'd be yeah. counted, but you're mm. in New Zealand, you'd be counted as um, coming from where you're originally yeah. from. Mm. Ben, that's, that's really quite important because you actually touched on the, uh, the issue of citizenship as well. So even though you are studying uh, in New Zealand, because, but if, if you're not a New Zealander, then you will not enjoy that domestic status in Australia, right? No, that's right. Yeah, you'd still yeah. be, because you're, you're in an, on an international student visa in New Zealand, you'd then need to um, get a, obviously yeah. a new visa to study in, I imagine, in Australia. Yeah. Uh, Amelia, question for you. So is there only a few region open in Australia for now? Or maybe you just want to re-highlight about the different uh, stages? Yeah. 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 And um, sorry, I know I moved through that really quickly and it's a bit confusing. With Australia, um, maybe just to go back a step, you know, we're a federation, which is this, we've got this wonderful sort of Commonwealth, which is Australia. And then we have our state and territories um, which are uh, their own jurisdictions, like you might have a jurisdiction or a, or a council um, area. So at the moment, it's the state of New South Wales, the territory of the Australian mm. Capital Territory, which is Canberra, basically, which is inside New South Wales, it sort of sits inside it, and then Victoria, which is where Melbourne is. And that's based on those jurisdictions were fastest to get to over 80% fully vaccinated that's why they're the first to open up and so the other jurisdictions who are you know closely following on their heels to get to that plus 80 percent vaccinated are not yet open um, but they all have plans to reopen mm. and they're all dependent on vaccine rates some of them most of them are 80 percent some of them are 90 percent um, but they all have plans to welcome students back it's just that at the moment New South Wales, Victoria and the Australian Capital Territory are the only ones that are um, more open. And that's, I should just clarify again, and I know this is going to be disappointing to some people, that's in the first instance to Singaporean students. Mm. Right. Uh, ben, question for you. Uh, I think it's with, really, with regard to post-study work visa. How long can one work for after graduation? Oh, yes. Um, so... If you, okay, so there's different um, criteria depending on the level of study, but essentially if you're doing a um, bachelor's degree or above, you can apply for a post-study work visa up to three years. Mm -hmm. what, I'll, what I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll paste the, um, the link into the chat box from Immigration 
New Zealand. Um, so you can you've got you've got the right URL. But essentially, they, these these um, rights were changed. Well, I say recently. It's probably a couple of years ago. It feel, feels like recently. Um, and so that's a, basically a post. It's an open um, work visa, so it's not tied to a particular employer. And then, so that's essentially your first step. And then you can look further into um, what we call um, a visa, which is around a skill short, shortage. So if you are studying, if you have qualifications in a in a industry that New Zealand has a skills shortage in, then you are able to apply for for that um, that skilled visa to allow you to stay longer. And then you can obviously look further down the road towards um, permanent um, residency. So I'll. I'll find the link. Um, if you go, if you go on to the next question, Kamal, I'll find the link uh, and I'll paste it into uh, the chat. Good, good question, Prashant. Perhaps this might be relevant to Amelia as well in terms of the Australian post-study visa, work visa. Mm. And it's a little bit like Ben said, it's dependent really on your qualification. And it's, excuse me, it's um, between two and four. Sorry, I've got a sneeze coming. <laughs> Um, it's between two and four years, depending on the qualification. Um, and then there's also obviously those other options, um, you know, live, work and study afterwards. There's skilled migration um, pathways as well. So, so it is a little bit dependent on your qualification, um, but I'll do the same as Ben. I'll dig out the link and share it in the chat. Sure. Uh, Tanya has a question for you, Amelia. What makes you qualified as an international or domestic student? I think it has got to do with issues of residency as well. If you can just elaborate on this. So do you mean, I'm not quite sure. So if you are an internet, you can start studying as an international student in Australia from wherever you are right now. Um, so there are online courses through the Future Learn um, program, but also a number of the institutions are taking enrolments into certain courses, and it will be course specific, um, to start now and basically come later once the borders are open. So you could be an international student for Australia from wherever you're sitting right now um, around the region, which would be fantastic. And then once you can travel, you would be an international student in Australia. So I'm not sure if that gets to the question, Kamal? Perhaps in our context, Amelia, I think the question is also with regard to permanent residency and uh, you know, to a certain extent citizenship as well. It's like, uh, we know that students, some Cambridge students are quite keen to actually migrate to Australia. And you know, when exactly will they be able to get into uh, the universities as a domestic students? When can they be considered? What kind of visas are required? I think this is perhaps the, the nuance of this question that the students- Yeah. Okay, uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll post the, um, the immigration um, website into the chat because it is dependent on where you're coming from and what you're coming here to do. Um, so it may be that you want to come here on a student visa uh, and then afterwards, once you've finished your course, um, be on the post-study work rights visa. But then you might have a pathway um, to permanent residency or to citizenship. So it is a little bit um, individual and it is depending on where you're coming from mm. and where you, what you want to do. Um, but there is, I think there's a bit of a choose your own adventure on the immigration website. So a bit of a tool that you can work through. Yeah. Um, so let me see if I can dig that up and, and share it. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Amelia. There's a question on academic year starting in Australia. I think for both Australia and New Zealand, the academic year starts uh, in late February, early March. And for mm -hmm. some universities in Australia, you also have the August semester, uh, the second semester as well. Yeah? Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, a question from Fang Lin Chu. May I know for both countries, what are the great requirements? If I can answer that, uh, Amelia and Ben. Generally, if you are Cambridge students, you require uh, three A-levels to get into universities in these two countries. And if you're looking at the more competitive courses, um, you naturally would need better grades for your uh, A-level qualification. So that's, that's the, the short answer for it. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, are the fees the same for New Zealand students when they come to study in Australia? I think it's, in relation to the earlier question about the domestic status, uh, 
if you hold uh, a New Zealand citizenship, then you can be considered as domestic student in Australia. Uh, mm. Amelia, correct me, Ben, correct me as well if I'm wrong on this with regard to the fees structure. <laughs> yeah, that's that's right, Kamal. As a, if you're a New Zealand citizen, it's um, you'd considered a domestic student. But yeah, like we said earlier, it's yeah, I think a little bit different for other international students. Right. Thanks. Um, there is a good question for uh, both Amelia and Ben. Do we have to prepare personal statements uh, to get into universities in Australia and New Zealand? The way we need to prepare personal statements to to get into the UK or the US universities. Yeah. It's, what, it's are a little... gen, what are the general requirements? Are they looking at purely academic results or do they need more than that? Uh, you know, especially in relation to US universities who need your, you know, co-curricular, uh, holistic assessment, so on and so forth. Mm. So Ben, if you can just start first before I invite Amelia to chip in. Yeah, um, I can I can start. I mean, again, it's 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 there's no, I mean, our universities. Um, I mean, we've got only got eight universities, but they they have different criteria, as I mentioned. I mean, they are, it is a more of a holistic assessment. It's certainly not just on not on grades. There's no there's no exam or there's no um, uh, we're a little bit different to other countries in that respect. So it's essentially um, interviews with admissions admissions teams. That's the first step to gaining. That's probably a key point for me to highlight is. In New Zealand, that's the first step is to speak and get your offer of place from a from the university. So you'll be speaking as an international student, you'll be speaking directly with the admissions team and they will then provide you with an offer of place. So that's really your first step. And then it goes into the student visa application. So there's a range of, um, again, I've posted the immigration website there, but there's a range of or a number of steps that you need to go through in your student visa application but the first one still remains the offer of place from from the university all right thanks ben amelia if you can add to this yeah so it it also depends a little bit about um what you're applying for you know if you're applying for something that requires a you know an art portfolio or a or a sample of writing but apart from that it's those a levels that we talked about or the equivalent of um, the year 12 um, graduation or, or international baccalaureate that would be for undergrads so it's not that you you know every every institution is requiring you to write um, write a piece which I think is, is the question um, mm -hmm. but some of them depending on you know if it's in the creative industries or something else like that you know you might have to have um, uh, include something but um, I would I would say to people, you know, do just have a play around. Um, you know, there's so much information available on the websites and just take a look and say, oh, I really actually think I'd like to, to do that. And then what would be the requirements? And it's a really, there's a sort of a step-by-step -step guide um, that can sort of walk you through what you might have to do. And then you'll really get an idea of, of what the requirements will be. And I Thanks. think, Kamal, you've got the institution speaking on the weekend, right? That's right. That's right. For those who want to learn more, do visit us at the University Fair this Saturday. There are institutions from uh, Australia and New Zealand that will be having booth for you to visit as well. You can speak to them directly and get to know more about their requirements, right? Uh, I only have one uh, last question that I could entertain. With regard to the fees range for bachelor degrees in NZ universities, uh, Ben, if you could quickly answer that question. Oh, sorry, um, Kamal, do you mind repeating that one? The fees range for bachelor degrees in NZ. Oh, fees range. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, in in New Zealand dollars, so for Singaporean, or Singaporeans in the audience is about the same. It ranges between about twenty. We say about twenty-two thousand to thirty-two thousand dollars New Zealand dollars or Singapore dollars per year. So that's your standard um, bachelor's degree. Obviously, that increases if you're looking at, um, you know, veterinary science or other more specialised subjects. But that, on average, in that range. Right. Thanks, Ben. Uh, thanks, Amelia. Unfortunately, we do not have time to take more questions from the box. Uh, yeah, it has been very, very useful and informative. And for all of you who are keen to know more about Australian and 
New Zealand universities, do visit uh, the university fair this Saturday. It's 3 to 7 p.m. You can sign up for individual consultation with all the universities. I think from, Aus from Australia, we will have universities, uh, Monash University, Melbourne University, University of Sydney, uh, University of New South Wales, as well as Queensland University. And from New Zealand, we will have Auckland University as well as Victoria University of Wellington. So do visit uh, these universities this Saturday. Once again, thank you so much uh, to Ben and Amelia for joining me in this session. Hope to catch up with you again in another opportunity. To all our participants, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the week. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.